Hello, everyone. Can you hear me well? Lovely. So uh, first, like, uh, thank you, Michael, for a kind intro. And also, if you're in Zurich team, this is always great to come to engage with local community. Today, I'm going to share like a why developers drift away. But truly, what we're going to discuss is like a, what is the motivation developers come to the ecosystem, how they can stay, and what kind of like strategy we can take. So let's get started. First, uh, Encode Club, perhaps some of you never heard about this or like heard about us somewhere but don't know what we are doing. So we are education community. So we are helping you to develop your career path through different types of like learning program, building program, and also like a different career path program, which is like boot camps, hackathons, accelerators, and hacker house, and so on. So last uh, years, we have been working a lot with the different protocols and projects to uh, run developer training program or early stage projects onboarding program, and we could see specific patterns, and today we are going to share about that. So first thing, uh, perhaps some of you coming and thinking about what is the key like to uh, have a lot of developers on ecosystem. Everyone is questioning about this. And uh, I must give a lame answer. The absolute answer is there's no one specific solution fit to every protocol. Maybe if you think about what protocol has the most developers, maybe like three, four come to your mind. Do you see any like specific things they are all doing together? I'm sure that it's really difficult to find the mutual patterns like everyone doing that there's the best practice stuff. So there's a lot of components you need to do, but you cannot exactly copy the other strategy, uh, and there's like a multiple reason. First is like open and decentralized nature of the Web3 ecosystem make, us create dif uh, make it difficult to creating like some developer retention. Like we cannot generate like how to say natural luck in fact. And this limited control over our audience is actually a feature. That's what, what we love about Web3. Like we come for permissionless, like a system that anybody can come and build and deploy on your network. And if they don't like, they can leave. So we actually like it. But when we are on the shoes, uh, in the shoes of like onboarding developers, we start to worry about how can you lock them in? Why we actually came to this ecosystem? Because we don't want to be locked by something. So let's think about how can we provide specific value to developers. Uh, low switching costs. So, like as we discussed about, like creating lock-in effects. Like we have a very low switching cost. Like you cannot, like um, you cannot charge them a membership fee of the uh, one year so that they will stay in your platform. So it's rather easily people can come entering and exiting your platform. So you can see that platforms are uh, making different vampire attack. Especially if you have a uh, similar tech stack, you will have a, like a similar events trying to luring others into your ecosystem, which works. Also, you need to think about that same way you can lose your audience as well. So why developers are coming to Web3? Uh, I specifically said that why developers, but we can ask the same questions to ourselves as well, because a lot of people are coming to Web3 due to, in the beginning, maybe similar but yet broad reasons. One is, like, of course, like a passion for learning something new. A lot of people people coming in Web3, especially even during the bear market, are like a people who are genuinely curious about something new. That doesn't mean necessarily they are staying around, because when they see another new and interesting thing, they may run away. But this is still like an interesting point that like early stage like developers, uh, users are coming into the market because they are very, very curious, and they will become your market users and advocacy, uh, uh, becoming an advocates. And another thing is, of course, like attraction of the uh, ethos, like decentralization and autonomy. Now a lot of debates going on with the mass adoption, making less this like ethos visible, but still we cannot you know, neglect that this is like a great ethos, like a driven a community. Another thing is, of course, you, are you have a desire to be part of some revolutionary shift. So there's some technical like, paradigm changes happening every 20, 30 years. Uh, perhaps like, a fast is like 10 years, but there are certain things you have missed. When I was young, you know, like when people were building like, a uh, internet, like I was like, a user, but I couldn't contribute at all. When there's dot-com bubble, everyone making an app, I was like, basically a teenager. But then like, when smartphone comes, when people start to making an app, again, like, I miss that that wave. And I see that like a blockchain is another interesting paradigm shift. And I wanted to be in and I see that a lot of people are coming in there. 
And of course, afterwards, like we heard a lot that people come for tax, staying for community. So you see that a lot of smart people like are working with you. So those four thinking people, collaborative community make you stay. And of course, like uh, last but not least, we cannot lie to ourselves that a lot of people are coming for the potential financial upside as well. But those like uh, grifts, like it should be match your ecosystem needs. So if you're building your own ecosystem or project and you want to onboard a developer, you need to think about why you need those developers in your ecosystem. And if your stage of your projects or protocol is serving those. Let's say this is like a kind of simple ones. Like when you think about you want to raise your awareness, you want to test your product market fit, you want to like test your latest protocol updates, support some tooling and infra projects by those developers coming in. So you don't need to hire 100 developers, but your community is going to be building. Or like finding some solutions like you couldn't serve it yet. So maybe your protocol is like a keep stopping, like you need to kind of test that with the community members or nurturing ecosystem projects, startups, and finding talents. If your ecosystem looking for developers and thinking that this is all you want at once, you are having a very wrong strategy because not every one of these can come all at once together. If your protocol is so young that there's no tooling and no like a, uh, jobs are like a ready there, how would you like a handle like some startup coming and building on top of it and they even don't have a basic tooling? So I'm not saying one is superior or it should be based uh, chronicle only, but what I want to say is like when you're setting up the strategy, you cannot simply ask your team uh, achieving these six goals with like one thing. Uh, it should be like a different approach and different things by stage and program. So let's think about why developers are coming, but why they are staying in your ecosystem and not going away. And before going further, I want to ask questions. What scale are we talking about? Because all of you want to have million dev developers in your ecosystem in the future, but what is the scale now we are talking about? In the end of 2023, you know, Electric Capital had a developer report about overall ecosystem. So there's a less than 7,000 full-time developer. And then this definition of full-time developer is the people who work more than 10 days a month. So it's basically like less than two weeks, you know, and we consider as a full-time developer. Monthly active developer around the whole ecosystem is like 20 to 1,000. So let's make a simple like, calculation over this, like a, how many protocols are, uh, are fighting for getting developers. Of course, it can easily we can say 100, but let's say there's like a top 50 protocols actively working on onboarding developers. If you divide like 20,000 by 50, we comes to like something like 400, 500 developers might be active while only 30% of them are actually full-time. So 150 full-time, why like 500 in average, which when you ignore that Ethereum has the biggest community in this sense. So in reality, all of you are gonna have a smaller set. So this simple math we went through. So uh, 400 like developers, while 120 gonna be a full-time developer in your ecosystem. Do you feel like it's a small group or it's a big group of developers, like 120 developers in your protocols? Small, right? Feels really, really small. But let me ask this question. If you're onboarding 400 developers every quarter, do you have 400 jobs in your ecosystem? Do you have 400 opportunities? They come not only taking one tutorial and finish, but do you have any other opportunities they can stay and do something if you don't have Maybe you don't want to onboard 2,000 developers at once, and it's a little bit delusional. So those retention hurdles, we need to think about why developers doesn't come back to your ecosystem. And we are talking about like a high number, why we actually don't have infrastructure or even opportunity to serve them. So you, you see that like a, there's a, like a little badges. So that what we need to do is that we need to improve the developer experience funnel by creating different types of opportunities, it should be curated like, so they're like, you shouldn't just simply follow the other ecosystem, how they're doing, because there's an even huge culture difference. And also you need to align that with stage of your ecosystem, depending on if you already launched your test net, main net, if you already start to have some startups that they start to offer some job opportunity, or are you still like working on basic tooling, if the basic tooling is driven by your core developer team or community team. So all this kind of thing gonna be playing a role to onboard developers in your ecosystem. So let's think about some simple funnel. 
So there's like a you know, funnel when you think about, like, hey, oh, there's a developers appeared. You may encounter developers in maybe conferences, like some general hackathons, so that they may not take your bounty, but they saw your name, they had a chat with you. Maybe like they saw you in some like YouTube or Twitter space. So like, hey, there's some example that they just discover you, and they just know your name, but they don't know exactly what you are doing, and they don't know exactly like what kind of thing they can do. And then when it comes to a little of more like a interest, like they will start to look into your documentations, they read some articles, and here it comes that they, be, they may see that a lot of Twitter thread of the rails of your ecosystem, they start to kind of get engaged, and they are following those market users, or their friends were talking about like, hey, I was building this, and they have something, something. Or like there are some kind of basic education tutorials they start to get to watch, because in this evaluation stage, they start to actually spend time, because first one is like, you know, they didn't decide to spend time, it just got exposed, but at the second stage, they start to like spend time and try to evaluate if I want to use my time more. And then they start to learn more. So once when they say they're like, okay, it's worth it to spend time a little bit, they will start to have some dedicated learning experience. It means that they may follow your boot camps, they will take some specialized workshop on specific SDK or like certain API, they will start to build something. Uh, even though there is no direct rewards there, they will request one-on-one -on -one support with your team, they will talk to your engineers, they come to your office hours. And after those, like, they need the opportunity, they actually can build. So they learn something and they start to build something. And building is sometimes like they are very creative, but sometimes you need to give some guidelines, which can be, uh, one is like a very specific hackathon focusing on, you know, your ecosystem, or like you start to kind of make the meeting in the community events, they start to feel more belonging. And this building period, period they are not only building projects, they actually start to evaluate the culture of your ecosystem as well. So they come, so in the learning pe evaluation period, they just check the documentation. In the documentation, if docu documentation sucks, they may just leave because they just don't see that, why I need to spend 20 hours to figure out this bug to having a simple test. When they pass this one, they come to like, you know, learning and spending some time. After that, like still they may not decide to build. And they're still going to think that this is worthy of learning, and I got some new you know, extra batch I collected, but I will not stay. Uh, but if they said that, OK, this was quite like a, a lean experience, I start to build a little, a little thing, and then actually they start to evaluate your culture as well. At that time, it's really important that what kind of contact they have. If you see like a, one of the biggest dev communities, it's crazy how many times they are spending time with the developer in one-on-one -on -one interaction. I know this is not scalable, but your market users in the beginning, the small set of people who are going to be the advocate of your whole ecosystem, you need to actually spend time with them because a lot of them are going to be following your ecosystem in a way, unreasonable way. At a certain point, they like it, then it's beyond the tag, they like the culture. I'm not talking about fun way, just like a meme culture, but in general, people start to like, you know, build a relationship, they start to feel belong there. You didn't ask, but they start to explain about your technology to someone else, and then their friends come and building together. And this afterwards, like you need to then have like this like lawyer users, uh, they become your advocate. You need to offer programs like ambassador program. Like maybe you need to create an accelerator, incubator, grant program who want to be a startup in there. Or you offer bounty program who doesn't want to fully commit, but they want to freelancing around because like they can just take, you know, contributing to the creator dashboard, or they want to like fix some box for you, or different career opportunities and many more. These are not set in stone in an exactly chronicle order because maybe some of the events you want to use for different purpose, but what I want to say is you need to think about how developers come to your platform, how to discover until they become a lawyer and uh, advocate users in your ecosystem, you can need to provide certain opportunities. Otherwise, you may just like you're gonna say uh, in a paper number, like we have like 2,000 developers got onboarded in our ecosystem, but definitely the, there will not be 2,000 different activities around in the ecosystem. So that's pretty much it in a nutshell. And uh, what I wanted to say is like, a, obviously there's no single key and one uh, solution I can say that like a, it, in this stage of your protocol, you just need to follow this formula, but you can see that this is quite complex and still a lot of parts are not scalable solution, but you need to go through the funnel. So you, 
uh, my suggestion is, like, okay, pro first, you need to, of course, like, talk to your own DevRel team. DevRel is the best. Uh, there's a several DevRels here. So DevRel is the best. Like, okay, you need to talk to them how to build those, like, relations with the uh, uh, developers. It takes time to see your community sentiment and what kind of, like, opportunity you can offer. And then, of course, you need to create all those educational contents around so developers are going to be keep learning and going forward. Um, you're going to offer like job opportunity or any other opportunity. They can stay longer and becoming a person who can contribute and they can create opportunity for someone else. So that's pretty much it. And if you have any question, I am very happy to answer. I wrote, uh, I wrote my Twitter accounts there. So they're like okay, happy to, uh, happy to um, send me a DM if you have any other question. Also, Incode Club, so we are education community. Uh, we have a lot of different education programs for developers. So if you want to take some program as developer, you're very welcome. If you're ecosystem building um, developer community, you want to discuss about education program, I'm very happy to discuss as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Omti. Do we have any questions from the audience? Hello, thank you. Um, I actually have a question uh, regarding the hackathon part. Uh, we found out that a lot of people just show up for the hackathon, they build on hackathon, and then they just leave because the reason they were hacking on the hackathon is because of the bounty mm -hmm. and not because they, could, they were actually interested in, in continuing working with, with the protocol. And that has actually made us drift from hackathons a little bit. I wonder what strategies do you recommend mm -hmm. or would you uh, define for making these people stay instead of just mm -hmm. drifting away? So very good question. So a lot of hackathons, um, this is not only actually the worries about the protocols, but that's the worries about the hackers as well. Because often hackers are asking us, they're like, hey, I started to become a multiple hackathon winners, and people are keep asking me to build on different protocols. I don't know what to do. Uh, and then even though they have some motivation to build in like the same thing further, and they start to get some like, you know, temptation that others are asking, if you build this one, is it going to be like kind of short-term rewards? So this one, my suggestion is like, if you're thinking about different types of hackers who come to build like a father, but who just like build for the bounty, are they bad actors? I would say they are not actually bad actors. Rather, we need to design bounty more clearly and cleverly. So those bad, so to say, bad actors who are perhaps like quite skilled, uh, yet they are not intent to stay in your protocol. You need to use them as a product tester. So your hackathon projects they must be a tester, so that there's a very specific new protocol updates. You want to make them some hackathon projects so that your DevRel team doesn't need to build a demo anymore. So you need to make them build a demo for you. You need to make them testing things for you. Those those hackathon prizes are kind of freelancing bounty. So they're like, there's a competition building, uh, they're building a demo for you, and then they're leaving your ecosystem still fine. They contributed their own way. If their idea is very innovative and open source, because it doesn't exactly belong to them, because it's kind of open source projects, then others can build on top of it, and I see it as a contribution. So if you're rewarding certain hackers building exactly the same thing, then you should stop rewarding them, but rather make them try very new thing, a little bit like push the boundary, and then they leave, still it's worthy that you use them as your extended DevRel team. And then maybe each time when you have a new feature to try out, you can invite them again because they will be very interested in trying something new and then building a prototype for you, and they will leave again, which is completely fine. So my suggestion is like a Please, like, hey, don't reward someone building exactly the same thing. You need to perhaps even, like, hey, making a two different types of track for people who are making copying app-ish when they're beginner. But if they're, like, a good developers, even though they don't want to stay around, use them as, like, part-time contributor, try to build a developer. If they're, like, hey, making great prototype, that's a great win. Any other questions? Do we have any other questions? Hi. Um, so I thought you made a lot of uh, really good points throughout the presentation, and I'm curious if you had any um, stories or kind of real-world examples that you could share of protocol or of projects that 
uh, do those things either really well or haven't done those things really well? Mm -hmm. So there's like a, a few cases I can share. So one thing is like the individual developer, let's say. So it's around two and a half years ago at the Dev Connect Amsterdam, we were giving a, like a, this a discovery time. We were giving us some like a workshops on request. And there was like a, a lady like sitting in the crowd and she was there even, not because she wanted to come, her friends was coming, she was Web2 person, she just came there, she was developer at IBM or like some kind of Web2 company. And then she started asking some provocating, like, questions, you know. And after those workshops, like, she sent a message that she's actually interested in and she wanted to learn. So we provided, like, a Solidity Bootcamp slot to her, even though she didn't have any, like, uh, experience previously. And then after, like, Solidity and expert Solidity, you see that, like, a, those people start to come to the hackathons. And around, um, so last year in Denver, so around a year later, uh, we got the news that she became a solution architect at Open Zeppelin. It took a year. And then a lot of hackathons, you want to have a KPI in like a two days, three days, or in a month, but it takes a year for developer onboarded in the ecosystem and ending up having a job so that they can have a sustainable their dev journey by themselves, not protocol injecting money to their, like a, uh, their how to say, their like activities. Same thing with uh, like a startups. Like a, we got some startups like asking us, they're like, okay, uh, we are uh, we are keep suggested building something from scratch all the time. So I'm not saying that every hackathon should be like this, but in Encode Club, what we do is like we allow people entering the hackathon with the existing project. But what they need to do is they need to build something like a new feature on top of it, and they will be only judged by the edit part. So that if you are in in the motion of the longevity, you can still incentivize them building something, making a fair playground to compete with the others without stopping them, and by doing that, you see that like, sometimes they come, they don't need to, ex let's say you're building a game and you want to test in a VRF. You don't need to like, build a game in the hackathon, but they were making a launch menu, select a VRF app, which they're having an existing project, they're gonna implement it. So those kind of curated approach, depending on the stage of your ecosystem, stage of projects, you need to offer differently. So some success stories, I would say, is like those type of developers who successfully ended in the job, or those hackathon projects who successfully raised and then ending up in the ecosystem. But there's a cases that also they move the different ecosystem depending on the support. So like at those one, um, if you're a protocol, I don't know if you're a protocol uh, a case or if you're the project case, but if you're a protocol, you want to curate your program and those like market users, you want to stay in contact very tightly. Thank you so much, uh, Omchi. Uh, another round of applause, please.